So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Frank McKenna. I'm joined here today by with Whale Al Haddad. Um, the topic of today's seminar is application framework for regional loss estimation. Our work is done here at Berkeley as part of the Neary Sim Center, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, some upcoming events just to um, advertise them. For those of you who are interested, in the next couple of weeks, we have a number of interesting seminars on UQ and AI specifically targeted towards those working in um, natural hazards. Also, we're going to have a high performance computing demonstration of um, a regional event simulation of an earthquake. So, let's talk about today. I've got a basically going to do th three things. One, I'm going to give you an overview of the Sim Center. Then I'm going to talk about this, oh, the Sim Center, the application framework that we are actually developing. And then, as an example application that can be developed using our framework, we're going to actually specifically spend a lot of time talking about an application framework for regional loss estimation um, for earthquake events. So, the Sim Center um, basically it's led and directed uh, by a number of um, senior faculty. Um, the co-directors are Greg Deerline and Sanjay Govinji, who's actually the, the, the PI on the project. We have a number of postdocs working on this project, and we also have a number of faculty members from different institutions around the United States. So what are we exactly? Um, to NS in NSF's eyes, we're actually an experimental facility. We consider ourselves to be a virtual experimental facility. Um, what we are doing is we're producing software applications and providing educational activities, and those are aimed at advancing research in natural hazards engineering. Um, so what are the applications that we're developing? If we look at the grand challenges that the, you know, over probably a thousand professors um, got together and looked at all the different grand challenges and the different natural hazards, um, they all came to similar conclusions in all these different reports. Basically, the applications we develop have to change from being deterministic applications to applications that produce uncertainty quantification in the output response. The applications, they also want applications that perform performance-based engineering, not just for earthquake, but also for, for wind and water events. And also applications that deal with the, you know, the big picture, community resiliency. How does these hazards affect a large region and how does that region recover after the disaster? Finally, they also recognize the important need for developing educational applications that will educate our next generation engineers working in natural hazards. So that's what we're doing. So as part of the, 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 our effort, we're developing educational applications. Each year we have, we're, we've promised to develop two educational apps. So far we've developed four that are available to, um, to download. Um, but probably the reason why you're all here is you're interested in the researcher applications that we are developing. We're developing a number of research applications. Um, UQFEM, which is an application to enhance or imbue FEM, existing FEM applications with UQ capabilities. We're also providing new applications for earthquake engineering and wind engineering. Um, we're an application for performance-based engineering. And this RDT, basically an application for re regional resiliency. This is their schedule for the re release of those um, research tools um, and the RDT. Now today I'm gonna to be talking about this regional earthquake version one, June 2018 application that we've developed using our framework. Because ultimately, you know, how are we doing this? So this now I'm gonna talk about the Sim Center, the application framework which is basically behind all these applications that we're building will be using the Sim Center framework. So the Sim Center is developing an application framework that will enable the creation of scientific workflow applications for researchers working in natural hazards engineering. So what, we, what where are we doing? We're developing interfaces, code that meets those interfaces, and applications. Um, the ac applications are designed to be both flexible and extensible, so researchers come, can come along, modify the applications, or add their own applications to the framework. Um, so those, uh, many of you are familiar with OpenSeas, so I'd like to 
explain what the framework in terms of basically OpenSeas. So what is an, an application framework? Basically, a framework is a collection of software for building applications in a specific domain. The framework defines interfaces, um, the components, provides codes that implements the components, and then provides, finally provides example applications that can be developed using the framework. So if I'm using OpenSeas as an example, OpenSeas is really a framework. It defines interfaces, for example, materials and elements. Um, we provide applications, for example, OpenSeas.exe or OpenSeas MP and OpenSeas SP are example applications that are developed with using the OpenSeas framework. And we allow people to you know, both provide new materials and elements, thereby extending the framework. And we also allow people, you know, people use the, the applications. They provide their own input files to run their own specific simulations. Now, what's different about the, the Sim Center applications is they're actually workflow applications. So what is a workflow application? A scientific workflow application is basically we're taking multiple applications and stringing them together, and we're automatically taking the output from one or many programs and providing them as input to another program. So there's no user, there's no human intervention here at all. The, the data is automatically passed from one program to the next. So the Sim Center classes, if we go back to the open seas analogy, we're actually, they're, they're actually applications now. Of course, existing applications don't fit together. You can't take existing applications, take the output, say, from open seas and feed it directly into PACT. It doesn't work. Um, so the Sim Center, you know, we're defining these nice interfaces that each application must meet so that it'll fit nicely into the framework. And of course, we all, everybody wants to use existing applications. So what we do is we provide wrappers around existing applications where we provide code that'll take the input that, that the framework expects and turn it into the input that the program was looking for. And then we take the output that the program generates and we put it into the output format that the Sim Center framework requires. And then finally, we've got some additional inputs and outputs that the, the application needs. So this is an example of one application developed using this new Sim Center framework. We call it the workflow for regional earthquake response. And it's available on GitHub at the, at the following URL if you're interested in downloading the source code. And this is an example of one run that we've done with this, you know, one, one, ex, you know, one, one, one example run that we've done with this application where we've taken the Bay Area buildings, we've got some input ground motion, some seismic simulation. We combine the two to produce some output and then we compare that output, say, with the recent Haywired event. Um, well, we'll talk about this in, in his presentation. But I say the so the inputs for our for our for our to run these seismic simulations, these seismic event, these regional events, it's basically an input file. It's like an open seas input file. So every time you if you want to run the, the workflow with a different to, for a different region or for a different earthquake, you basically modify your input file and then submit that to the application, and the application will run a different, you know, a different um, simulation. So again, the applications, you know, this file, this input file, it's, it's a funky format, it's, it's, an, it's a JSON format, but in there it defines what the applications are that you want to run inside this workflow. So we're running multiple application um, sequentially in this workflow. And this part of the file can, shows you what that is. And inside that file for every specific application we want to run, we have basically the inputs and outputs that that program needs um, in addition to what the, the framework provides. The little black boxes on top of the, um, the, the jigsaw pieces I showed earlier. So to change the workflow, you know, if I want to run a different simulation, I basically go to my input file and I make a change. Okay, now I can run a different regional simulation instead of using the results from um, Lawrence Livermore SW4 program, I'm going to use OpenSHA. Um, to do my to do my simulation. So how do I do this? Um, with the application, there's a configuration file. It needs to know when it sees what an application, 
the, the event application name and the input file. It has to know what application do I actually run. So it goes to a configuration file. And this configuration file, that application has to be defined in the configuration file and basically the location of the application to run. Okay? Now, in, by providing this configuration file external to our application, we're not building this configuration file in there, we allow researchers, such as yourselves, to come along with their own application, add it to this configuration file, and then they can modify the input file to use their application, and it should just run just fine. This is kind of what the sequence diagram looks like for our um, for a running workflow. Basically, we start off, we get the buildings, then we go get the event, then we go get the structural analysis model, we go get the engineering demand parameters we want to um, simulate or record in our simulation, then we perform the simulations, and we go get our damage and loss estimations. Say, for example, we're just doing a damage and loss assessment. But ultimately, what's, all these red boxes, they're files we're passing around between the programs. So this is, this is what we're handling internally when we actually run our simulation. And on top of this whole thing, to complicate matters, we throw uncertainty quantification around the whole thing. Um, we don't, for example, we've got our, our building models. We don't know the heights of the buildings exactly. We don't know the mass of the buildings exactly. We don't know the, you know, the ground motions exactly. So there's a whole bunch of uncertainty involved. We throw uncertainty quantification around the whole thing. Um, so I'm going to get into more specifics about the particular regional earthquake simulation. And the, Wales is going to do that in the next presentation. But just a quick reminder. Um, so I'm talking about what Wales is going to talk about is this regional earthquake simulation application that we've developed. Um, it is a workflow application. It takes input files, which you can modify to run different applications. Um, and if you want to extend the application, you basically have to go to the configuration file and add in your new app. If you go to some new application, you would add it to that configuration file. And as long as that application meets the input and output specification for the workflow, the application will run just fine in this workflow application. Now, ultimately, this time next year, well, I will have this RDT tool. All the RDT tool is going to do, it's a desktop application. It will have different um, bars on the left for each of the different applications that we can run. When you select the bar, you can, it's going to ask you for the input parameters for that particular application that are unique to that application. Um, this application will then create a JSON file on your local machine. It will then run that job either locally if you want it, or it will run it at DesignSafe um, on the Stampede 2 or the Wrangler system. And then it will take the results back and present them to you. So that's the RDT tool plan for release next year. And now we're going to hand this over. And Wales is going to present specifically about the um, regional earthquake simulation application. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> Thank you, Frank, for the introduction and uh, the overview. So um, uh, um, in my presentation, I'll be actually focused on the application framework. So I will be talking about the different workflow applications that are currently provided with the uh, framework. I'll also talk a little bit about the abstract uh, uh, definition of each application, what each application does, and I'll also talk about the interfaces between these applications, the different files that Frank was talking about. And uh, after that, we'll talk about the test bed. We have a test bed for the San Francisco Bay Area uh, that we use to uh, kind of exercise the uh, workflow and uh, see how it works. And um, we'll also have a demo to uh, show how to run this workflow on a local computer for a small number of buildings, of course. Uh, just to demonstrate how it can be configured and uh, what the outputs look like and uh, um, how it works. And at the end, we'll have some time for questions and discussion. So if we look at the workflow, 
um, our main objective is to do a regional simulation where we have a region of interest subjected to um, a hazard scenario and we're interested to uh, estimate the damage and loss that happens to the region. So um, uh, basically, in, in other words, we have, we're, we're mostly focused on buildings at this point and we basically have a building database um, for the specific region that we're interested in. And, uh, and we just run the region simulation to estimate damage and loss. And if we break this down for a single building, then the workflow basically starts from a building information model. So out of the building database, we pull one building, and this gives us some information about the, the building, things like the number of stories, the area, the year it was built, and stuff like that. And given the hazard scenario, we um, compute or evaluate the, the event input on that building. And then we go through the process of creating a structure analysis model to uh, find the building response, and then we can do damage and loss estimation. So basically what we see on the screen here in this workflow, um, so for every single building, we need to obtain these five different files. So basically for, for this presentation, for the rest of the presentation, all these parallelograms with uh, yellow, light yellow background and um, light blue color, these are input or output files. And uh, so we basically have these different files, BIM, Event, SAM, EDP, and Damage and Loss. And I'm gonna go through a little bit more details about the applications and the interfaces and how it works. So starting from a building database, we need to go through the first process of creating a, bil a building information model. And given the building information model, information about the location of the building and the year built and things like that, we can uh, basically, um, use the create event process to find the event input uh, on this building. So uh, let's say we're considering an earthquake scenario. So giving the building location and how far it is from the, uh, from the uh, earthquake rupture, we can use uh, some models to evaluate the ground motion or the event input on in the building. Of course, for a different hazard, it may not just be the location that's needed to evaluate that. It might be also the building geometry or the dimensions. Um, the next step in the workflow is to create a structure analysis model to be able to compute the building response and create the EDPs based on the event we're considering. So for seismic events, we have particular EDPs that are important for loss assessment. After that, we perform the simulation, uh, run a finite element model, let's say, and we get the values of the EDPs. And at the end, we do loss estimation using all of these files. So this gives you the overview of the workflow. So we have basically five different files which we consider as the interfaces between the different applications. And we have six uh, main applications here. And now if we want to introduce uncertainty, we introduce another application called Perform EQ, uh, which Frank talked about briefly and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later. But basically we uh, we would like to be able to introduce uncertainties in all of these applications and be able to propagate the uncertainties in all of these files that we produce. And so basically we have seven uh, types of applications in the workflow. I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about the currently registered applications. And by registered, we mean they are available as part of the source code. They have been integrated with the uh, workflow and we have try to demonstrate that they work. And uh, these are the different applications that we have. So if we talk about a create beam application, application we have two different uh, uh, implementations that we provide with the workflow. One of them is the generate beam database. And the other one is urban sim database. The first one uses just a simple flat file to define the building database. And the urban sim database takes uh, building information from urban sim simulation outputs. We'll talk about each one of these applications in details, uh, but I just wanted to give you guys a, an overview of what car, what is the uh, what is the list of current applications that are registered with the workflow. Um, for creating a seismic event input on the building, we have two other applications as well, and uh, one of them uses outputs from SW4, which is a uh, uh, fourth order seismic wave propagation uh, application. And the other one uses seismic hazard analysis and record selection and scaling to obtain the ground motions. 
And then for CreateSAM, we currently have one implementation that was provided by uh, Professor Jinjing uh, Lu from Tsinghua University. And uh, that application creates a multi-degree freedom shear building model. We'll talk about this too. For uh, EDPs, we have a standard earthquake EDP that defines the uh, peak floor accelerations and story uh, drifts as the EDPs that are needed for this earthquake application. Uh, for performing the simulation, we use OpenSeas to get the ETPs, and for loss assessment, we use uh, an application that was uh, also uh, contributed by Professor Lu's group, and that application uh, basically uses the FIBA P58 procedure to estimate the damage and loss. And finally, for doing uncertainty quantification, we have one implementation that uses the COTA that propagates the uncertainty in all the, the applications. So I'm going to talk about each one of these applications and implementations in detail. So if we start by talking about the CreateDiv application, basically the purpose of CreateDiv is uh, we, uh, we want an application to pull the building information model from a database. Um, so in this case, uh, we see on the right hand side, this is just a sample building information model. It has some basic information about the building, things like the year it was built, the number of stories, the square foot area, the height, and the uh, occupancy and the replacement cost and location. And we basically want to obtain this BIM file for each building in the region. And this is the first interface file, basically. So if we can obtain a building information model in this format, the rest of the workflow can use and consume this information and use it for the rest of calculations in the workflow. Uh, so this is the first file that we define here, a BIM file that includes this basic general information about the building. And one of the implementations we have is just a generic database file that uses a flat CSV file that you can provide. Uh, so you need to obtain this information, basically the area, the number of stories that you built, the uh, type uh, of the building, the, basically the occupancy type and the location. So if we have this information and we can use uh, this generic BIM database to obtain BIM files for each building in this uh, region of interest. And uh, this application uh, will uh, also have to make some assumptions to obtain some of these values. So if we look at the input here, for example, it doesn't have replacement costs. So we'll talk in a little bit about what kind of assumptions uh, these applications would use by default and how they can be configured. Um, another application that can be used for uh, creating a BIM file is Urban Sim database. And what this application does, it takes the outputs from an Urban Sim uh, simulation and use that to create the BIM file. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm assuming some of you guys might be familiar with Urban Sim, but if you're not, Urban Sim is basically a platform to model and analyze urban development. So uh, um, for example, if you can think of a case where you are interested in studying a region under the effect of a hazard, but you're studying this region in the future. So basically in the future, you're building inventory and uh, population and many uh, values that you need to use in your study might change uh, because of how this uh, urban area develops. And, um, and because of that, you might be interested to use um, some of these urban development um, tools to study the region, let's say, in some time in the future. And uh, basically, this is one of these applications that would use outputs coming from urban sim and provide the same building information model uh, that we're talking about. So this is kind of demonstrates what Frank was talking about. So you might have an existing application and you try to create some wrapper around it that uh, no matter what format of data it has, it will still output the data in a format that the workflow can use. And uh, this basically, this um, allows us to create this standard interface that can be shared between different applications. Um, so for both of these uh, previous appli applications that I mentioned for creating the building information model, there are some um, assumptions that are being used to do uh, things like structure type mapping. So we don't, when we're talking about um, a region with hundreds of thousands or millions of buildings, it might not, we, we may not have all the data that we need. So for instance, the structure type, the material that was used um, in some of these cases are not available. So in these applications by default, it 
uh, maps the occupancy and the, the year of construction and the number of to stories to different structure types. And this is the default mapping in the tool, uh, but it can be controlled by a configuration file. So if you have a different region of interest and you want to change this, that, that's possible. And uh, in some of these cases, the, the structure type, uh, the mapping uh, is done to more than one structure type. In this case, the structure type becomes a random variable and it gets sampled and uh, it will be assumed that all of these types are equally likely in that case. Uh, another assumption that goes into creating this building information model is the replacement cost. It's uh, currently in this application based on the hazard default evaluation, which actually comes from RS means. And basically the way they do it is they uh, specify the uh, replacement cost per unit area in square foot, depending on the occupancy, and they have a factor for the contents. So the, the contents replacement cost is a factor of the structure replacement cost, basically. And again, these values are the default, but they can, can be controlled by a configuration file. The next application in the workflow is the create event application. And uh, now that we have obtained the building information model, we would like to use a create event application to get the event input and the structure. And in this case, because we're talking about seismic um, uh, hazard, then the, the input on the structure is basically a uniform acceleration. The ground motion basically. So we need things like the number of steps in the record and the uh, time series and the um, uh, time step and so on. And we need the ground acceleration in different directions. So this is what this event file provides. This is just a sample of what type of information it might include. And again, we, we have two different implementations of this. One of them um, uses results from SW4, it's called LL. And LSW4 and it, uh, SW4 was a is a 3D wave propagation um, simulation for seismic waves, and it can be used to simulate uh, earthquake scenarios. And uh, it's developed um, in the Lo uh, Livermore Lawrence National uh, Laboratory. And uh, in addition to that, we also had collaboration with uh, Professor Arthur Rogers from. Um, LLNL and we also have some, uh, we obtained some data for a magnitude seven Hayward uh, earthquake um, simulation. And we can use this for example in our simulation. And uh, the way it works is uh, the results you get from these simulations can be defined at a grid of points over the region of interest. And basically this application will do a nearest neighbor search and find the nearest site with ground motion coming from the simulation and use that as the event input. And uh, another alternative for defining the event input on the structure is another application we call uh, SHAGM. And this application basically uses seismic hazard analysis and ground motion record selection and scaling um, to find um, ground motions at, again, this uh, grid of sites across the region. And basically it creates a grid and it finds the ground motion at each point, and then it uses, again, nearest neighbor search to do the analysis of the building. And for this application, we might need to provide more information, things like the earthquake rupture, the geometry and the magnitude, and uh, ground motion prediction equation, and a uh, database of ground motion records, such as PRNGA West 2 records, for instance. The next step in the workflow is create SAM. And um, SAM or a structure analysis model is basically a file that has the geometry of the structure analysis model, things like nodes and elements, and also the structure and material properties. And uh, this is just a sample of how it might look like. And uh, we have one implementation in the current workflow that's registered, it's called MDIF Lou. Um, as I said, it was provided by Professor Lou and um, there is a reference here for um, how this application does um, the modeling. And basically this application creates a nonlinear shear building model and it makes some assumptions such as all the floors are uh, having the similar mass and height and stiffness. And it also considers some uncertainty um, in the stiffness and damping. After that, we um, the next process in the workflow is the create EDP. We have uh, one implementation, which is the standard. It is used for earthquake engineering. 
And after that, the next step is performing the simulation. And the current implementation in the workflow is the OpenSea simulation. Uh, this is a sample file of how the ETP looks like. And after we perform the simulation, basically this file gets updated with the values of the EDPs, things like the peak flow acceleration, the drift and the residual displacement. Uh, the final step in the building work workflow is basically doing the damage and loss assessment. So given the building information model and the EDPs that were evaluated, we can uh, use the FEMA P58 procedure to estimate the damage and uh, the consequences, the losses, the uh, downtime, the red tag probability, and so on. Uh, so we have here the repair cost, the loss ratio as well. Um, so in the workflow, we currently have one registered application, again, also provided by Professor Lu, and the uh, application uh, would uh, take as an input um, also the ATC curves and uh, files that define the normative quantity for the components of the building, both the structure and non-structure components, and these files can be configured as well, and, uh, and it estimates the damage and loss. Uh, uh, for the building. So this, we went through the six basic applications in the workflow. There is one more application which handles the uncertainty. It's what we call perform EQ. And basically what this application will do is it will call all the other applications. And whenever one of these applications define random variables, it will start sampling them. So I'm assuming here, let's say we have uh, building information model that define random variables and a structure analysis model that define random variables. For instance, we can have a height as a random variable and stiffness and damping as random variables. Then the uncertainty quantification application will basically create different samples and for each sample we have the whole building workflow. So starting from the BIM, events, um, EDP and damage and loss. And at the end we combine the uh, damage and loss estimates for all the building samples. Uh, so this is how uh, UQ is handled in the current workflow. Uh, the last thing is that this workflow can be configured. I think uh, Frank went over this quickly. So I just wanted to point out a couple of things. There, there are two configuration files involved here. One of them is the registry. It's where different applications are being registered that can be used in the workflow and just a configuration file for the workflow. And the way to run it is just to call the Python script for running the earthquake simulation for the region and pass in the configuration file and the registry file. So we have actually exercised this regional simulation workflow on the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, we obtained the magnitude seven earthquake simulation using SW4 uh, from Dr. Rogers and his colleagues, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, we had a an inventory of 1.8 million buildings coming from urban sim and um, we used uh, damage and loss calculation provided by FEMA P58 Lu and the structure analysis model the multi-degree freedom shear building model also provided by Professor Lu's group and um, we made sure all of these applications satisfy the interfaces for the sim center framework and we were able to run the simulation and the results shows uh, 141,000 buildings um, that are tagged and the building damage of $84 billion and um, damage ratio, a net damage ratio for the whole region of 5.6%. Um, so you guys can see in the figure, there is a lot of red colors on the, in the East Bay. That's because it's on the Hayward Falls, so it's in the East Bay area. Um, so this is just a visualiz visualization of some of the results we get. So you can see that these results are actually on the parcel level. There's loss ratios uh, for San Francisco and Alameda counties and uh, the red tag buildings in the East Bay. Um, this is visualized in QGIS. And the only thing I want to point out here is that the results obtained from this workflow are on uh, the building le level or the parcel level, basically. So they are... Um, um, fine grained, I would say. Um, so uh, there was another study uh, called the Haywire scenario, and that study uses hazards for the loss estimation. So we wanted to have some comparison between running the 
test bed that we had for San Francisco and other studies that does the similar thing. Unfortunately, we can't do a one-to-one -one comparison because they both studies included different building inventories, uh, but it's still a comparison that uh, would show us uh, um, how far things are. So uh, um, in, in the Hayward scenario, they considered different counties in the Bay Area, so they had three million buildings. Some of them were a little bit far from the uh, from the uh, rupture actually. And uh, if we compare it that buildings, so the uh, concluded 100,000 buildings will be attacked. The building damage in the test bed that we had was more than double of the one in the Hayward scenario. The net damage ratio, the loss uh, ratio also is um, higher. And the total building cost that we included was higher as well. So the building inventory was a little bit different, but we can at least see that it's not one order of magnitude difference. So uh, there is still some comparison between the two studies, I would say. Uh, but there is an ongoing effort on uh, doing more detailed comparison between the two studies. Um, so right now I'm going to do a demo. So my plan is to actually do a live demo. I have a recorded demo just in case things go wrong. So I'm going to uh, minimize my presentation and do a live demo. Um, so uh, this is the workflow folder on the right hand side here. So we have this regional earthquake simulation uh, Python script. This is how we run the workflow. And this script needs to, to read two different files. For the first file, as we mentioned, the application registry. So I'm going to open this one to show you guys what information is in there. So <laughs> this is basically uh, defines all the applications that are registered that can be used. So we have, for example, for um, uh, the building information modeling, we have the urban SIM database application, and we have the generic VIM database application that we mentioned. Uh, it also shows where this application can be found and any specific inputs that this application takes. So this application takes a building file, for instance and uh, some just some other example the um, let's say the mdof flu application is available in this location or the standard earthquake edp application uh, is available in this path and and so on and so this way you can add your own application by defining where the application is found and what kind of application data needs to be passed uh, uh, so this is um, the application registry I'm going to show you guys also the configuration file. So this is the configuration file that we use for uh, creating a workflow. So this file will basically do loss estimation for 10 buildings in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. I'm, I'm just choosing a small number of buildings because we wanted to uh, run something quickly and see the results. Uh, so for this workflow, for this particular workflow, I'm using generic BIM database and I'm pulling this, the building data from a CSV file that I have on my hard disk. And uh, this will be running locally in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, I'll start running it. Um, and for, for this workflow, we're using the Hayward 7.0 earthquake simulation uh, that I was mentioning earlier. Um, for the modeling application, we're using MDOF2. And this application needs uh, some data from Hazus, so it, we can point it to any application specific data that it needs. Uh, we're using standard earthquake EDPs, we're using OpenSeas for simulation, and we're using FEMA P58 loop for the damage and loss assessment. And for handling uncertainty quantification, we're using the quota basically. So I have all the files I need to run the workflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this uh, Python script. And I'll say run demo workflow. And I'll provide the application registry. And this should run the workflow for the 10 buildings uh, that we were talking about. So we just have a small database of buildings. You see it running building one, building two. While it's running, I'm, I'm going to show you guys what files it's producing. So. Uh, it created a folder for the demo workflow that we're running here and it started creating the files for all the buildings. Uh, so things like the building information model. So in this workflow, we um, 
we have a building information model that defines the height as a random variable with a specified mean and standard deviation. Uh, this first building was a residential building and uh, the structure type was, it's, it's, it's a timber structure and it calculated the replacement cost, the replacement time and so on, and the location of the building too. Uh, so for this building, it actually went through all the computation and obtained the uh, damage and loss estimates. So this building has a 0.5% median loss ratio and uh, repair cost, the mean repair cost was uh, $4,600. Uh, so it has done that for all the buildings basically, just to give you another example, this is another building. And uh, this one has a slightly higher uh, loss ratio, 7.3% and uh, the red tag probability is 11%. And uh, we can see here that it went through this workflow for all the buildings. It ran 10 files and generated a log file that we can look at if uh, something goes wrong, we can use it for troubleshooting. So it generated all these files for the buildings, the files that we talked about before, the BIM, SAM, event, ADP, and so on, and the damage and loss file. Um, I intentionally let uh, this workflow leave all the intermediate files so we can see what happened actually. So it created a folder for each building, created a template directory that have files that defines the random variables and it ran uncertainty quantification. So that's why we see here different working directories that were generated. So for this building, just to run things quickly on my local computer and demonstrate how this works, um, we just had five samples per, per building, which may not be sufficient, of course, but this just demonstrate how it works. In each one of these folders, this is a sample of the building where the random variables have been assigned values. So for instance, if we open the building information model, we see that this uh, random variable for the height has been assigned a value of 2.79. The average was three, if you guys remember. And uh, that's basically how it works. It will sample the random variables and go through the whole workflow and generate all the files. Uh, you can see here there is an OpenSeas uh, model that was generated and it, gener it created all of these outputs, produced all of these out. So this is basically how the workflow works. Uh, I'm going to show you that also it has some post-processing tools that can aggregate all the data. So for all the buildings that we have, we have a list, a table basically of uh, the repair cost, the downtime, and the red tag, if any, and the loss ratios and the locations. This kind of file is uh, suitable for consumption in GIS tools. So this is how we actually created those uh, plots and visualization early, that we showed earlier in the presentation by using these CSV files. Um, that basically is my demo, but uh, before ending the presentation, let me uh, tell you guys about the resources that you have. So if you're interested in using this uh, uh, workflow, you can check the uh, source code of the workflow on GitHub. We have links here in this presentation and uh, we also have documentation for the workflow that's posted on the website and <clears throat> we use uh, for the most part we use slack for communication we have um, uh, a uh, channel in the design safe slack account for the sim center earthquake workflow uh, this is a link for the channel and also this is a link of how to join slack on design safe so if you guys are interested please join us there and I think that can be a very useful discussion on uh, the workflow. Uh, so before I end my presentation, I would like to give some acknowledgements. We uh, would definitely like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Rogers and his co-workers at uh, the Lawrence Livermore and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs uh, for providing this ground motion data for the magnitude seven earthquake on the Hayward Fault. And we would like to thank Professor Jinjin Glu and his research group for contributing implementations of CreateSAM and Create Loss applications. Uh, and we also would like to thank Professor Jack Baker for his discussions about seismic analysis and uh, ground motion spatial correlation models and record uh, selection and scaling. And we also acknowledge the contributions of OpenSHA, which is a library developed by SCAC for seismic hazard analysis that we use by one of the tools we have. 
And we definitely want to acknowledge the uh, support of the National Science Foundation um, that funded this project. Um, so now we can start questions and discussion. Um, the way this works, we, we actually have, a, uh, we have quite a large number of participants, so it will not be possible to uh, allow everyone to unmute because it can uh, get a little bit confusing who's talking. So the way it works, we'll ask you guys to uh, use the raise hand tool. So uh, basically, if you go to the participants uh, list, you'll find a, a small button at the, uh, at the bottom of the list that uh, says raise hand. And if you raise your hand, it will show up for us. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but uh, this is basically the list I'm talking about. If you don't see it, it should be on the lower panel in your uh, Zoom uh, application. You can click on participants. You can go there and raise your hand if you have a question and uh, we'll be able to unmute you uh, and you will be able to ask your question. And you can also, if you want to type it down, uh, that's also fine. You can type it in the, uh, uh, the group chat uh, window and we just uh, relay the question and answer it. <clears throat> uh, we have still like uh, 12 minutes or so, uh, so. If there's no questions, we'll, we'll end this. I, I saw uh, Professor Govinci. Okay, there are some people who raised their hands. Just one moment. Um, I think, okay. Professor Govinci, and I think I unmuted Professor Govinci and also someone else, I guess. There are 68 participants, so I'm pretty sure someone has some questions. <laughs> but I, uh, I can see. Okay. Um, so there's someone raised their hand, but it looks like they may not have a mic, so it's not allowing us to unmute them because it's, sh it's not showing here that they have a mic that is muted. So, uh, so someone with the name DL. Um, so if you can check your mic, just make sure you have a mic set up and we'll be able to unmute you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, can you say a, a word about what someone would have to do if they want, don't want to run it locally, but they'd like to use the design site? Yeah, so um, at this point, uh, they can get the source code, they can build it. We have a guide on how to build this, and they can build it and run it on design safe if they have allocation. Uh, we are actually working on providing this as a Agave application where people can invoke it using the Agave API and we'll probably wrap some UI applications around this. Uh, but at this point, if someone is interested to run it on HPC, they need to have their own allocation. They can get the source code and build it. Should be pretty uh, straightforward. And uh, that's how we did it for the test bed. And uh, if they need particular data, they might need to bring this into their own allocation and they will be able to run their simulation. So, so the source code is provided, it's open, anyone can get it and run okay. it. So they would have to bring it into their workspace on TAC, compile it, and then they could run it. Yeah, Yes. Uh, but this process is pretty straightforward. We have step-by-step uh, -step, um, uh, 
guide of how to do this in the documentation and also on the GitHub repository. Okay, there's some questions appearing in the chat, so you can look there. Okay. So, uh, someone asked, uh, um, how could we have access to this webinar later? So this webinar is uh, being recorded and we will post it on the uh, Design Safe um, YouTube account, I guess. And uh, it should be available through the Sim Center website too. Um, um, I don't know the timeline for posting this, but it should be in a couple of days, um, if I have to guess. Um, so it will be posted online. Um, Someone asked, how would you run it non-locally? So I think, okay, that was Professor Gubinch. Someone also asked how to get our own HPC or allocation of tech resources by design safe. Oh, it's a, that's a post by uh, Tim that shows how to get this allocation. If you want an allocation to run this in the HPC, basically go to design safe um, and just search for allocations. And it should bring up an allocations policy page and you'll find the information there. Someone asked, um, uh, out of the 1.8 million buildings in San Francisco Bay Area, how many had the female model building type before you performed mapping to fill in the missing data? So in that simulation, we, we didn't have uh, uh, building types in the test bed. So uh, we had occupancy type and the year of construction. So we basically mapped the structure type based on the uh, mapping that we showed in the slides. Um, so for some of them, it's it's a one-to-one -one mapping. For others, it becomes an uncertain uh, property because we don't know. Um, so that that basically gets propagated as an uncertainty in the original simulation. Of course, if if we were if we have this information and if we know exactly if we know more information about the uh, building inventory we can modify the applications so that they they don't do the mapping for a building that has a known structure type let's say um, someone said a yeah, professor uh, Lowe said uh, if I wanted a student to eventually expand on the simple model you are providing how would you recommend that they start what are some easy modifications to make? What are some more challenging modifications? Um, so uh, I guess uh, the, the way it, it should work is uh, they probably need to start by just running this workflow locally and understand how it works and also understand the file formats because the files are assumed to be interfaces between the different modules in the workflow. And once they are familiar with these file formats, they can basically remove one of the applications and provide their own implementation for the same purpose. For instance, for CreateSAM, for creating the structure analysis model, they can write their own CreateSAM application that uses different assumptions. So as we mentioned, the one that we have, it just assumes all the floors have the same uh, mass, the same height and so on. But if we have detailed information, we can come up with a more, a higher fidelity model than we can basically write our own application that creates the structure analysis model. But the produced structure analysis model will need to be in the same format uh, that is produced by any. So basically, the formats of the files is supposed to be a standard. And of course, it might evolve as we go forward if we want to support more capabilities or enhance the capabilities of the workflow. But for the most part, if someone wants to get the current workflow and they want to uh, change one of the applications with a different one. The output needs to be in the same format, basically. Uh, the documentation for the workflow is actually in this link over here in the presentation. So uh, it's uh, in the Sim Center website. If you go to research tools and uh, you will find the regional earthquake simulation workflow. And this is where you can, uh, you can find um, the documentation. There's also some documentation in the GitHub repository, um, but that's more relevant to people who develop. So if someone wants to contribute to the uh, source code or they want to bring in their own 
applications, they want to modify the applications, uh, then that might be uh, relevant for them. Let me see if someone raised their hands by any chance. Um, I don't see. Uh, no hands and no more questions. <laughs> So if there are no more hands or questions, um, we'll call a day. Oops, no. How can we use this workflow for multi-hazard analysis, for example, earthquake and wind? Frank, would you like to talk about this? Well, earthquake, we're actually, um, that's the subject of our second test bed. <laughs> um, so we're actually looking at that right now. Basically, we need to get the wind loads on the building. Um, the framework itself, the actual, is set up so that it can handle one event after another. If you actually look at the input file, you'll see that the events are actually in an array. Um, and basically the code will take one event and then if there's an event following it, it'll, it'll run that event. Um, right now we just need some wind applications to generate the forces on our buildings. Um, someone asked, how do you recommend visualizing simulation data? So. Uh, by simulation, I'm not sure if by simulation it means uh, the open sea simulation, but visualizing things like the loss, um, uh, the damage and loss values and uh, the damage and loss assessment uh, can be done in GIS applications. I'm assuming visualizing anything can be done in GIS tools, uh, but this requires getting the building footprints and also having accurate locations of the building uh, inventory. And we have exercised this process for the test bed and documented it. So if someone is interested in uh, visualizing results similar to the way we did in the test bed, uh, there is a small guide on how to do this in QGIS step by step, how to import uh, the building footprints, where to get building for footprints, how to import them in GIS tools, and how to import the results from the uh, Sim Center um, simulation, regional simulation, and how to join the layers to be able to do a parcel level visualization. Um, the source code, someone asked about the source code. Um, I think, we, uh, let, me, let me send uh, the links in the chat window too. So the source code is available here. Uh, but I think this presentation will also be posted uh, on the website on the workflow page. Um, we can also post it on the Slack chat room. Um, okay, someone else asked, um, is there a link to the building database you used? Uh, the full 1.8 million buildings is not available. Um, we, have, we have a slimmed down version that we can hand out to people that doesn't contain all the, as I said, the 1.8 million buildings. We're not at liberty to release that one just yet. Yeah, there is another question that uh, maybe we can talk about. So someone asked, uh, um, how does this simulation take into account the building element model nonlinearity, the damage residual quantification? Is it from current or available open seas elements? Yeah, that is the case. So if you look at this um, reference, it actually goes through the process of creating uh, these nonlinear uh, shear building models. And um, Basically, it, yeah, it uses zero linked elements in open seas for, um, for the nonlinearity. It's a model that inc includes uh, also degradation and uh, so nonlinearity and degradation in the, um, uh, the, the uh, structure strength. <coughs> we'll skip that one. Um, can we do the k-dimensional tree offline for NN search? We'll do that offline. Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, so I'm not sure, uh, I'm not exactly sure about, maybe it's possible, it's, it's better or more efficient to use a quad tree. And maybe that's because the grids we shown um, are uniform, but it's not also necessary. It's possible to have just a, a um, a group of sites that, that doesn't represent a uniform grid of points. So that's also possible. 
there. That's one possibility because when you do when you do this process to get the event input, you can you can pretty much select any. So maybe maybe in a particular location you need more fine grained uh, points um, because you're more interested in this location. In other location, the grid can be coarser or something like that. So. But it, it is, of course, possible to find uh, other uh, search methods to uh, find the nearest neighbor. So there isn't uh, there isn't a strong preference to using uh, k dimension trees. It, it can it can be done with probably other methods too. Uh, someone asked if the slides uh, are available for download. So they will be available later today. Yeah. yeah. Can the framework be applied to every type of building, moment frame, brace frame, buildings equipped with dampers? And the answer, the answer to that one is that it will be. Um, right now we're, we're developing a tool that will um, parse different um, types of models. Um, the existing model, the shear buildings, it also does walls. Um, we're, I'm actually actively writing the code that will handle moment frames and um, brace frames. Let's see if uh, anyone has raised their hands. Um, I don't see anyone raise their hands. Okay, we're now running overtime. <laughs> <laughs> so unless it, there's a question posted, we're gonna we'll bring this to an end. I wanna thank you all for, for attending this seminar. I encourage you to attend the ones um, in the next couple of weeks on the AI and the uncertainty quantification and the presentation by Dr. Rogers on that large simulation. Um, it's actually a quite interesting presentation. I'm going to talk about how they use hundreds of thousands of processors to actually do that simulation. So if you're interested in things like you know, high performance computers, and um, that's actually a presentation very worthwhile to watch. So we'll call this a day. Thank you, everybody.